Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, everyone, so much for, for inviting me to speak and for having me uh, come out tonight. Um, and thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is a, an immense honor. Uh, I've been uh, a, a fan of, of Japanese prints for, I guess, uh, what feels like a long time now, but in reality, it's just since about 2009 or so, I discovered the art form, and it just, it, it really just struck a chord with me uh, to the degree that it's become sort of a all-consuming passion. Uh, and I think you'll see a little bit of that here tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to at least be able to share a little bit of that with you. In, in my personal studies, I found that the biggest uh, sort of impediment to learning of more about Japanese prints and uh, ukiyo-e in general was I just needed access to more and more information. Uh, I needed to be able to physically see more prints, both I guess both in person and, and virtually. I needed to be able to read more about them, learn more about the history and the time period, uh, and I needed to be able to compare prints uh, of you know, multiple editions, multiple states, and these are all things that really happen best in sort of a connected digital world. Uh, uh, all these things become much more accessible. One of the things I started with immediately was uh, acquiring and reading lots and lots of books. And I think this is probably the case for many uh, 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 scholars of UQA, is that you you find yourself just, you, you have to consume and learn so much information, uh, 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 and that if you really want to understand what's being depicted on a print, you have to just dig in uh, uh, to so many different topics that you may have never been interested in before. I now know way more about Kabuki theater than I ever did in the previous five years of my life. But it's been really interesting. It's been a very uh, much a growing experience, and I've, I've loved every minute of it. So my bookshelves are completely full. And I've also spent a lot of time uh, also just trying to physically look at prints. So you know, going to, you know, going to uh, auction previews and stuff like that, and just taking that, that nice rare opportunity to see them in person. So one of the things that, that comes with this is that th I feel like to, to myself this this is a slow process. You know, you're, you're you're you know you're reading, 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 looking, but I want to find ways to make it even faster. Uh, um, I'm uh, I'm relatively young, and I want to find ways to see if I can you know make a computer to use it to augment myself, to make it, to make it so that things I may not know otherwise I can I can learn. So one of the things that I've been doing here is, again, using programming to solve this problem. John Carver already covered uh, 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 most of this. What I ended up doing was building this website, okioa.org, after, after the art form. And what this website is, it's, it's a database of Japanese woodblock prints that I've collected from many other institutions around the world. Uh, so these. Are, are, are you know many eminent institutions? So like you know many museums, Museum of Fine Arts, British Museum, the Met right across the street. But the, the big thing is that I uh, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't collecting only Western English institutions, but also institutions from from Europe, from Japan, I'm trying to create sort of a very comprehensive resource. And I'm very proud of some of the resources I pulled in. I have the Tokyo National Museum on the website, and actually it's the only online resource for viewing prints in the Tokyo National Museum. Uh, there are no others, they have them on their website. Uh, I can talk about how I got them later. Uh, and so, so uh, there, and another thing I've, I've been doing, uh, which I'll talk more about, is I've been translating the Japanese museums into English and the English uh, uh, Museum to the Japanese. Uh, so this was a truly universal website that can be used by all scholars uh, around the world. We have, uh, right now, it's, it's about a quarter million print images. Uh, so this is you know, rather substantial. This is, I'm trying to, I think the biggest institution right now, I think the uh, Museum of Fine Arts has about 40,000 prints. Um, so this is you know, many times bigger than that. Uh, also includes prints from, uh, I, I'm not, I don't exclusively, uh, so I, I, I guess I tend to err on the side of wanting more and more print photos, and I'll take them from wherever they come from, because I feel like it helps to improve my understanding and education. So I will, uh, I'll pull from museums, uh, dealers, universities, 
and also libraries, other databases, auction houses, uh, wherever they may come from. Pulling all these things in is, is a lot of work. Uh, I, I don't really have time to, to cover that much of that tonight, but suffice it to say, it, it, is, it is quite substantial. One of the things I do on the website is I organize prints by artist. So you can easily go through and see all the prints by a particular artist. And this can be very, very useful when you're researching one particular artist. And you know that this artist has created this certain print or this certain series, and you want to go through and see all of them. Some artists are easier than others. You know, some of these, some of these early artists, they only have a hundred or a couple hundred prints per day. If you go to go to later artists, you start getting, you know, a, 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 as you might expect, um, thousands of prints per artist. I think uh, Kunisada has ridiculous numbers, like 40,000 impressions right now on, on the website, and, and it's, it's, it's going to go way up as I include more. So this is so this is at least a very I, I like this because this is a fun way to be able to navigate and see artists uh, purely from a visual perspective, where you can see and be like you can see how the art form has changed over time from the 1700s you know, up to the 1800s up, and even up to modern day. Uh, I, I do expand through the entire history of woodblock printing. So when you view a one particular artist, you can see all the prints that that artist has created. So this is a, you know, a, all the prints here by uh, Sun Show um, from all the different institutions. So the Museum of Fine Arts, the, the Legion of Honor, uh, the Tokyo National Museum. So it, it's, it, it brings it all together into one source. Now the one thing that I found was that was very frustrating when I was doing the research was if I had a, a Sun Show uh, print I would, you know, and I wanted to find more information about it. Like I would, I would start. I would go to the Museum of Fine Arts, and I would type in Sun Show, and you know, I would go through the list, and there would be hundreds of them. And I'd be like, well, it's not there. Okay, well, I'll check the Met, and then now, then I'll check the. I would just keep going down the road, and eventually, you just kind of give up because it's super frustrating. And so, but so one of the things this this helps with, at the very least, is that you can go through this list and get and see everything that is by this artist, at least within all the institutions that I've included here. Uh, I think at the moment I have 28 institutions. One of the things uh, I, I pull in as well is all the information that the museum or institution provides about the print. Uh, typically speaking, this is information like uh, you know, the name of the artist, if, if there's a title of the print, uh, a date, uh, information like that. Um, I'm working on expanding this, but right now, those, those are the details that, uh, that I provide. Additionally, uh, you can search by particular keywords. Uh, so for example, this is a search for the word cat. And so these are all the prints where the museum or, or dealer or whomever included the word cat in the listing for that print. And so you, you can get a, a very interesting selection of, of uh, imagery. The one trick here though is that uh, I am translating, uh, I, I'm not translating the words from Japanese to English or English to Japanese yet. I will be working with a, a Mitsumeikan University. They, they have a library mapping that I'll be using for that. Just to show an example here, so this is an example of the listing for Haranobu in both English at the top and Japanese at the bottom. So this is what the website looks like if you're visiting it in English uh, at the top, which is what most of the sites are going to be looking at it. But additionally, there's the complete other version of the website in Japanese, completely in Japanese. It, 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 it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, this brings in a very different uh, audience. Um, actually, one thing I'll mention right now is that right now, the website uh, receives more visitors in Japan than it does in the US uh, currently. Um, which is interesting since I don't know that much about the people who are using it in Japan. Um, so yeah, here's a here's a, a, a view of what the website looks like in Japanese. Uh, one thing, one caveat I'll mention really quick is I can't sufficiently read or speak Japanese yet. I'm working on that, um, but I can do uh, I can do it up to, to to cheat and get by and at least make a version of the website that is available in Jap uh, Japanese. So one of the big things that I really, really wanted to, and this is what I wanted to aid my personal research, 
was the process of finding a print and learning more about a print was incredibly, incredibly difficult. To start, you're going to have, at the very least, given a print, you're going to you know, read the signature uh, of the artist. Hopefully, there is a signature of the artist. Once you have an artist, hopefully, if, if you can read the title, that's at least getting you into a ballpark of what the print might be. You can use books to at least help aiding looking up of the artist's signatures and looking up publisher seals and things like that. But all in all, this is a very time-consuming process, uh, I would say, for most people. One of the things I did was is I made it so that if you look at a print, so this case, this is one of Busai's famous, from his famous Waterfall series. And this is the same print in uh, 14, or sorry, 15 institutions. So these, these are all different impressions of the same print. Uh, you see here, so they, you know, from the Museum of Fine Arts, British Museum, Honolulu, Harvard, Tokyo National Museum, the Met, all, all, all over. This is nice because now you don't have to go hunting around because one of the issues is that there's, one of the things I found out is that there is actually relatively little, let's say, agreement amongst the various institutions about who the artist is, or what the title of a work is, or all this, all this information. So one of the things that this tool circumvents is that it looks purely at the image itself and says, OK, well, these images are very, very similar. In this case, you can see they're, they're all depicting the same imagery. Um, so based upon that, you know, let's show all these prints together. Now, one of the things that's really nice is that you see here a few of these prints so the Tokyo National Museum, there's actually a giant color bar in this side. And the one down there from uh, Mitsumekan uh, is actually black and white. It's not even in color. So my image match in here is actually able to find the same print, even with these differences in, in, in industry. And this stuff happens very, very often, um, as, you, as you might, uh, might expect. Additionally, I want to show this case. So this is a, a, a diptych here. And this is uh, a, you see the one here at the top. One thing I want to point out, um, I will leave this institution nameless. Um, but this particular is, they, they, they actually upload the diptych, but they put it backwards. <laughs> the, 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 they should be in the, in the other order. Uh, we can see here, there, there is a copy at the Met that is in the white order. Uh, uh, so, so cheers to the Met. Um, <laughs> And, but the, the nice part of the tool is that even with this discrepancy of having the prints backwards, it was still able to find it. Additionally, it was able to find individual sheets of that diptych uh, in other institutions. Um, so again, this can be very, very useful. Uh, and, and, and I just mentioned that this works in the reverse, where if you have an individual sheet of a diptych or triptych, it'll find the diptych or triptych at another institution. I'll go a little bit more into that in a moment. Uh, it even handles uh, discrepancies in, in, in color as well. So one of the big, big things, so this, this, is, this is what I, what I was working, working towards, was the ability to do what's called an image similarity search. And what this means is that instead of doing a text search, so, so instead of saying cat and finding all the prints that you know, uh, talk about a cat, what you can do is you can go to the website, and I'll show some demonstrations here, you can go to the website, and upload an image. Specifically, you, you choose a file to upload. And for example, if you have a mobile phone, that might case an iPhone, or an Android device, or something like that, you can take a photo of a woodblock print. And with that photo, it'll find that print in all the institutions, uh, wherever it may be in, in this database. Uh, so, so in this case, I took a picture of uh, a Kuniyoshi print that I, that I own. And it's in the Museum of Fine Arts, you know, uh, uh, Tokyo Metro Library, Edo Tokyo Museum, British Museum, and then pages go on and on. This is a very common print. So this is what I wanted because this makes the research process, it takes it from, in my case, many hours. Uh, uh, for others, maybe less. Um, and, and it provides you with the information you want instantly. Uh, because now I can look and I can go and I can be like, okay, well, what does the MFA say about this print? And find all the information and see like, okay, well, here are all the details. And, and my research is pretty much done at that point. I can feel pretty confident that I've learned uh, what I want to know about it. Uh, just to show another example here. So this is just a, a, a print uh, on the Museum of Fine Arts website. 
And one thing that you can do is if you're viewing an image that's from elsewhere on the internet, you can right click it and say, depending upon your browser, you can say copy image URL, go back to, the, go back to my site, the ukiyoe.org, and find that image uh, uh, from that website. Now, the nice part about this is obviously you can find that print from the NFED, but if, let's say, you are a collector of prints, and you find a print on an auction listing, and you want to learn more about it, you can copy that URL, put it in, and find more information about that print. So, uh, so in this way, you, 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 there, there are many ways of doing research. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the ways in which people are using the website. There, there, now that there, so I released this website in uh, December of 2012. Um, and since that time, it's, it's uh, I, I, I've been so, so grateful to see the response from everyone who's been using it. And uh, it's just been so exciting. So I want to talk a little bit about, thus far, how, uh, who's been using it and how. Uh, so right now, uh, currently about 30,000 people are using it a month. And in total, about 340,000 people have used it. And the people who do use it use it a lot. They are currently about 8.6 million page views. This is since I launched in December 2012. Additionally, as I mentioned, alluded to before, uh, Japan is currently the largest uh, user of the website. Uh, and then the United States and then Europe. And actually, if you look at, if you're breaking down by uh, continent, it actually, well, it actually goes, it goes Japan, then Europe, than the US uh, is actually the third largest. So it, it's, it's interesting to see how, at least for me, to see how global this is, that everyone is really interested in uh, uh, this art form. In the case of, of collectors and dealers, and, and also I would just say uh, auction houses, one, just the ability to do auction research. Here, here's an example of an auction listing. Uh, I just I grab one at random. This is uh, uh, Lot 55, 20 Japanese woodblock prints, each depicting a female geisha figure with calligraphy throughout each print. There is zero identifying information in this auction listing. There is no information about the artist. There is no information about the content. Female geisha figure, you cannot be more vague than that. <laughs> this is a case where you can go in and take a photo uh, uh, from the auction listing, like I've done here, drop it into the website, and you get listings for that those exact prints uh, at other institutions, or in this case, at a dealer and in the Tokyo Metro Library. Uh, and this works uh, uh, really well. And I, I, I feel like we're kind of in um, this interesting little interim period here where some auction houses are using this, but there are obviously some auction houses that aren't, as you can tell by the previous list. <laughs> um, so there, there's at least this, there, there's a brief, brief window here in which uh, you, know, you can learn more about these prints more easily than the auction houses can. And additionally, there's also an opportunity here to learn more about completing incomplete diptychs and triptychs. For example, here, this actually just, uh, someone emailed me just the other day, he had this exact issue where he had an individual page of a diptych, and he had come to my website, and he was so happy because he now discovered what the other page of that diptych was. Uh, it, well, he was then interested in acquiring it, which I could not help him with. Um, but at the very least, now he can, you know, given that one page, he can see that there are these completed versions of it, uh, and that potentially now he knows what to look for, what to ask for, maybe what to acquire someday. Another thing that's really uh, useful is being able to compare states or editions of prints. So going back to the example I had at the, at the beginning of this uh, uh, Hokusai uh, waterfall. So I have this, in, th in this case, th there's this one print I don't remember what institution it's from, and here's another copy of another institution. Now, one tool I provide on the website is that if you go to a print, you can click a, a button that says compare prints. And when you do that, you get this view. I'll try to click back and forth, it's a little tricky. And you can see here, it lines the prints up directly on top of each other. So it, it, it completely ignores whatever the institution has done. It figures out exactly how they should be aligned and lines them up perfectly on top of each other. Now, the thing you note here, I just want to point out, look at the very top. Uh, um, you see that particular, uh, that's running at the top. So you see how much is cropped off that print? I mean, so this is really, really useful, obviously, because now you know, okay, well, you, you can tell this print's cropped, 
you don't know how badly it's cropped. But now you see this other one, like, okay, that looks like a half inch to an inch missing there. That's not great. <laughs> but like that, but this is, again, this is the sort of thing that can make connoisseurship, uh, it can really, really improve connoisseurship, at least for myself personally, because I've been able to go through and since I can, I can look at you know, a particular copy of print and, and look back at other versions, I can be like, well, I, I, I would with a high degree, or at least I feel with that at least some degree of confidence, know that this is probably real. Uh, it's, it's one of those fun puzzles, I don't know if you ever remember, like the, the I Spy, where you have like two images that are almost the same, but something's ever so slightly different, and you're kind of looking for those differences. It, it, can, be, it can be fun. It can also be really, really useful to researchers and scholars. Now, the way, it, it's been really interesting for me to see how, how this has been happening. And I want to mention a few researchers. Uh, so as John mentioned, I am currently a visiting researcher at uh, Reed Macon University. They've been very interested in my work and we've been working to find ways to collaborate. At least the most immediate way is probably just working on translations. Uh, making the content more accessible in more languages. So getting Japanese into English, English into Japanese. Additionally, both uh, Roger Keyes and uh, Dr. Uh, Tinos in the, in the UK have been using uh, the website pretty extensively for their research and print comparisons. And also uh, uh, Henry Smith, who is here today, I saw him right over there. Uh, I've been very excited about his current research, uh, which is he is doing research into usage of pigments, and in his case, he needs to know uh, specifically, in, in specifically what years certain pigments were being used. And this is the only thing, this is the sort of thing that can only be done when you have a large number of prints, because you want to know, for example, was this particular type of pig pigment being used in 1989, or sorry, 1889? And so it, it, you know, if you have, if you pull together, in my case, two, over 200,000, you can now have about 1,000 prints for 1889, and you can start to see, okay, yes, there, there are certain pigments being used, and you can start to make uh, uh, decisions based upon that. So I, that's something I'm very excited uh, to see and, and learn more about. Another thing that's really interesting is tracking changes in woodblock ownership. Now, now, this is not the woodblock print itself. It's of the physical woodblock. And this is really getting down to the heart of sort of you know the, the medium itself, which I love. So this is a, I just want to show this example. This is a case, this is one that uh, Dr. Tinios actually found. So these are, uh, this is a kabuki actor. Just, I want to jump back and forth. Obviously there's, there's pretty dramatic color differences here. But you can see as well that the face is different. The crest is different. The patterns and the clothes, the snow. The, the, there's, the, the, you, you, they're almost completely different prints, except you, looking back and forth, you can tell they're not. And so this is, this is one of these cases where, and if you go look at the full print, where the woodblock itself was sold to another publisher. The, the publisher seal changed down at the bottom there. And, and actually, if you dig in, you can find the other print of this. It, it's, it's a, a I'm not sure if it's a diptych or triptych yet, but there's at least one other print from that same print here. And again, you can go back and forth, and you see, again, that the face has changed. Uh, but what's interesting here is that these discoveries happen very, very easily with, with my particular tool. Because again, the tool doesn't care about whatever title might have been assigned to it. Because obviously, these are two different actors, so the prints would have had two completely different titles, for, for most likely in two different two different plays. There's actually the text as well as change. Additionally, this is a case where, where since the images match each other, you can now say, okay, well these images are, are pretty much the same. Let's go back and look at what might be different. And you get these really interesting discoveries coming out of it. And obviously this is an interesting thing just to, for research, researchers to explore, because if you start to better understand the economics of what block uh, sale in the Edo period from publisher to publisher. Now this is something that is, is very, very preliminary, but I think is, is very interesting. Because like when you collect information about prints from uh, uh, many institutions and across hundreds of thousands of prints, you get to see uh, information about print production over time. So this is the production, or at least 
I, 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 I want to put a lot of asterisks around this, but to say this is surviving print impressions of the institutions I've included in my website over time from about 1700 to about 1940. Um, and so, so I will say these are individual print impressions, not unique prints unto themselves. There are a few interesting things here I just wanted to, to show because this data confirms a couple of things. One, you can see the explosion of color printing from about early 1760 to about you know, you know, 1770, 70, when Harl Nobu came on the scene and, and just color printing exploded. And so you see that. You see that directly in the data that there was a corresponding increase in prints. Additionally, you see the transition from the Edo to the Meiji period where woodblock printing started to fall out of favor. Uh, where uh, print production started to decrease and people became presumably just, just, you know, just less and less interested and publishers started to publish less. Which is one thing I haven't, I haven't really figured out yet. So, because one of the things that that's, it seems to be common knowledge is that in, in the Great Kanto Earthquake uh, 1923, if I remember correctly, you know, there were many, uh, you know, many publishers were set back, many prints were lost. But one thing that's interesting is that there at least seemingly to me, there is no corresponding downtick in, in loss of prints. So you have 1923, and there's an uptick to 1924, and then a downtick to 1925. I don't know what that means yet. But this is a thing that I think would be really interesting for researchers to dig into. If you're interested in this, please contact me. I would love to work together. So I, I, again, I will say this is incredibly preliminary. I just want to bring that up because I think it's very interesting. So additionally, their museums are using this. They use it in a number of different ways. One is uh, uh, just simply just identifying prints. They have a print in their collection they don't know uh, 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 anything about. Finding other copies of prints, you know, you know, correcting cataloging details, all these sort of things. In, in general, just creating a better resource and catalog for their information, which is fantastic. So one of the big things that I've been starting to work on with uh, uh, John Carpenter at the Metropolitan Museum of Art is starting to find ways to suggest new attributions for prints. And in this process, I've developed a tool which is still very early on. And what it does is finds prints. In this case, on the left here are prints at the Museum of, or sorry, Mets at the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art that have no attribution. So there's a, these ones on the left have no attribution. However, there are prints at other institutions that do have an attribution. Uh, so this is, I think, really, really interesting because this is a case where with no researcher intervention, so that no scholar had to go in and look at this, this these are cases where a computer was able to automatically go through, find cases where there's missing information and that there's no attribution for these prints, and find details uh, automatically. One interesting discovery that actually came of this uh, initial work uh, with the Met has been this discovery. So these are these are two active prints. Uh, I'll just click back and forth. So you can see as before, uh, the face has changed, as with the other one. So so you can, again, this is getting back into you know the economics of the wood blocks themselves. You know the, the actor changed. Uh, uh, they, they, you know, they, they chopped out the head, they stuck it in a piece of wood, carved in a new head. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is that this is the signature of one print. This is the signature of the other print. <laughs> yes, Shunko Shunsho. So the art, so, so, so not only was the actor changed, but the artist was changed as well. Now this is really, really interesting in my opinion. I have never seen this before. If you've seen something like this, I would love to. I would love to learn more about it, because uh, again, this is. It's not clear to me if there's no publisher information, so it's not clear if this print sold to another publisher and they just completely chopped up the artist, or did one artist die and another one come up, or was one out of fashion and one came in? Like, it's not clear to me why they would remove one artist's name and put in another. Now, what's interesting about this to me is that these are two prints in the case of two different institutions, one in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one in the Art Institute of Chicago. They are by different artists depicting different actors in different plays. There is no identifying information between that connect these two prints together. However, 
since they are visually similar to each other, they were able to be discovered. Uh, and, and this match came up. So in the case of, of, of the Met, uh, uh, I, I believe the Met's had the, the Sun Show print. And, and then they said, well, here's this other copy of a Shunko print at the of Chicago. And you dig in, you're like, well, that's not the same print. But that's interesting. That's really, really interesting. And we should probably make a note of that or something. I'm not sure. Um, but again, that's this is the sort of scholarship that I think is really interesting and is completely new, uh, hasn't been done before. So one of the things that, as well, that is I'm starting to work on right now, or that I've been working on, I'm hoping to get it out here very soon, is the creation of an artist encyclopedia. So uh, right now on the website is, is this compendium of all these prints. W one thing I'll, I'll note here is that in order to have a good resource, you need to have you know, good information about, in this case, the artists. And unfortunately, online right now, there, isn't, there aren't very good sources of information, generally speaking. There are some books that have been published about uh, artist details. Most of them are online. Even in those books, there's often disagreement uh, about particular artists or how to read their signatures or, or what have you. So one thing I've been working to do is actually create a single canonical resource of Japanese print artists. It's going to be very, very large right now. It's looking like probably around 3,000 artists. And, not, and so it's be tricky because I want to have more artists that are actually in the website itself. These are just a small selection of all the different ways in which the name, uh, just Hiroshige, Hiroshige's name is written in all the different museums and libraries uh, online. And there is a wide variety. So like this isn't even taking into account the institutions that have just typoed his name, which, which does happen as well. You have many different spellings of his name. So I just want to show, so for example, here are four completely different uh, ways in which his name is written. All of them do and should correspond to a single reading of his name. And this is something that, it, that is actually immensely hard to do, uh, unless you have a good encyclopedia of artist names. So this is what I've been doing is collecting information about the artists, getting it in both English and in Japanese, the name of the artist and all of their aliases, uh, of whatever names they may have used in their career, uh, and additionally the dates on which the artist was born and died, and when the years in which they were active. At the very least, this can be useful to, to scholars, I hope, but also be able to do stuff like this, to be able to correct the, the readings of names. Now this case is particularly uh, obvious, since we, I, I assume most of us know this artist. However, to, I'd say, a lay person and to a computer, it's hard to tell which name is the given name and which one is the surname, for example. Uh, and this is a case now with a real encyclopedia of artists, you can start to do this. So I just want to bring up one example of, of the exciting things that can happen. So for example, let's say you have a print by uh, Yoshitora, and the dating of it is Meiji period. So in this case, you can start to correct the dates. But you say, well, we can know, okay, Meiji period is actually 1868 to 1912, and Uragawa Yoshitora was active from 1850 to 1880. So as a result, you can use, you can do a little bit of uh, algebra there, and as a result, if, if this print is by Yoshitora, and it was published in the, in the Meiji period, then it must be in this 12-year period of 1868 to 1880. That, that reduces down the possible range in which the, the print could have been produced down to just 12 year period. So this is something that I am excited about because now we can start to improve the dating of prints and provide even better information to museums and, and, and whomever. In the future, I just want to wrap up here. Uh, I, I'm very interested in expanding to other mediums. Absolutely, right now I'm focusing completely on Japanese prints. Um, in this case, you know, it, it, this, this is what I know, or I feel like I know. I have to start somewhere. And uh, but I'm very interested in spending in the uh, ehon, in the paintings, uh, into other Japanese uh, means of Japanese art. One of the biggest impediments here is that we need sources of photographs because this is how, that's how it works best. So uh, if you are aware, if you are interested in these things, um, to, I'll, I'll have some cards and feel free to drop me a line. And uh, if you know where I can find lots of these photos, let me know. I will be happy to uh, start working. 
Um, one other thing I'll mention very, very briefly is that I'm also looking at, I've been working on ways of applying this to other art forms, uh, not just singularly to uh, uh, Japanese art. I've been working with the Frick Art Reference Library uh, uh, just down the street here. And I've been analyzing portions of their uh, Italian art archive and finding really interesting cases. Of, so this is a particular case here where there are two paintings that are uh, actually not the same, they're copies. And they're actually copies of, a, of another Da Vinci painting. Uh, but this is a case where the, these prints are actually cataloged separately. Uh, but now there's a relationship between them. Just, just to close out here, um, so yeah, my, there, there's, there's the address for the website up there, the, for the ukiyoe.org. Uh, additionally, I've been uh, publishing some papers on this particular uh, Japanese print research as well. Uh, so that'll be up on, in this case, ejohn.org slash research. And if you are inclined and you're interested in programming, all the code that runs this website is also available <laughs> online. Um, some might be more interested in that than others. Uh, so I wanted to close out, I, I, I am happy to take questions. I'm also going to do a demonstration. We have a table set out up there. I brought some prints of my own. I know some other people brought prints of their own. And we can give it a try uh, and see see what works uh, so that I feel like that, that should be fun. Um, so yeah, well, thank you. I hope you have any questions.